So uh, yeah. I wanted to talk to you about uh, all these like people talking about how Yahoo is the true the true name of the creator and uh i just have a hard time believing that just because i i don't believe god or the creator can create man-made objects like you've never seen a book grow out of the ground with words written on it you can only grow the creator only can grow things of souls i believe like like grass trees all that stuff and then we can use those things to create stuff so for me to believe that the creator wrote a book put his name in this book for us and somehow it didn't get manipulated at all it's hard for me to believe and a lot of it a lot of people are pushing that as the truth now so i was just curious what your thoughts were on it right yeah i mean i don't think any book can contain the whole truth all the truth and nothing but the truth um i think uh, all books are man-made none of them were dropped from the sky and the, they say, uh, you know, it was inspired, the inspired word. The people who wrote the Bible were inspired by God. Right. Okay, but wasn't, uh, you know, every every author inspired? Like, by, I mean, uh, anyone that writes on a religious or spiritual topic would certainly say they were inspired by God, right? Yeah. Right. So literally, you can say that about every single spiritual or yeah, religious text ever written is it was inspired by god yeah of course it was that doesn't mean it was written by god that doesn't mean yeah. every word in the book is infallible truth right yeah. so yeah people take that saying and then they they like elevate it to this thing where suddenly god had a, a feather pen and and uh, <laughs> wrote this right. out for us it's like no it didn't yeah. work like that yeah. certainly yeah and i feel like a lot of people get in the trap of like when they fall down the rabbit hole of a lot of stuff they see is not what it is they want to latch on to whatever's trendy or going on like they like see a tiktok video is all like oh in the jewish scriptures it's referenced two thousand plus times or however many times it is and they like for whatever reason they want to believe that as the absolute truth other than the bible the other the other option but or the quran or the bhagavad gita i get a bunch of people from you know i get muslims and i get uh mm. hindus uh they all come at me and they're like eric it's right here and then they'll, they'll list off all the verses in their holy book yeah. that state that the earth is flat or motionless or whatever all the things i'm saying right. it's like see look in my holy book it says all the things you're saying eric so come on over so be, a Muslim, be, eric. Yeah. be a hindu eric be a christian eric be a Jew, yeah. Eric, whatever, yeah, whatever, whatever the case may be. But um, no, yeah. I, I don't think we need to, anybody needs these false labels, you know, no matter how good a book is. I've never read any book and just been like, whoa, I am now only going to believe this one book. Exactly. I'm going to call myself a this bookish person and everyone I meet, I'm just going to, you know, proselytize uh the wonders of this amazing book i mean there's a bunch of great yeah. books you know and i like a lot of the religious scriptures as well i'm not even putting them down so much yeah uh, exactly yeah. it's it's just the way people cling on to them and and then make, it's like, this is the one this is the one and only ultimate truth and don't you read that other bible mm -hmm. those other bibles were written by the devil like yeah. you know Christians will go that yeah, way. Like, like you can't even have an open mind or research what other people think because that'll delude you and you're of the devil. So yeah. even having like a view of comparative religion for some people is like, no, that's blasphemous. You can only look into one religion yeah. and you have to believe it right from the beginning. <laughs> a lot of the stories are the same throughout all the books. So it's exactly. like they just there are different languages. So you're not gonna write the same book and say you're not gonna call the same people by the same name, like it, it doesn't make any sense. Like Muhammad's not going to be in the Bible because we don't call people Muhammad. We call people Jesus, which is Jesus, but we don't call people that. It's just all how you pronounce it. And uh, right. yeah, it's funny. And it's all just a conquer, you know, divide and conquer strategy. They want us to divide ourselves like without even telling us to. Like we just, it's like a sports team. We pick this sports team no matter what's going on. Same with politics, you know. Like right. they could be doing the worst moves possible, but as long as you're, you know, I'm never going to root for the Yankees because I'm a Red Sox fan, you know, like my team could be sucking, but I hate the Yankees. So no matter how good they're doing, I'll never root for them. And it's just conquering divide, get you to split up and argue with each other for no reason. You're right. You're right. All these groups, 
any group, any named group suddenly becomes an entity bigger than it actually is and irresponsible. You know, like, so, so any group, you think of any group in it, there's going to be members that are detractors, even though they're in the group. There's going to be people in it that disagree. But right. because they're in the group, they now, they now become part of the power of that group. Even if 49% disagree with what the 51% of the group do, well, you've still got 100% of the power behind that. And then when that results in disaster, all groups can just disassemble into um, these hierarchies that don't have any one person that's actually to blame. So when, when you have a group, you've got all this power and no responsibility. It's like the opposite yeah. of Spider-Man. Or, yeah, they, you know, that, they that split quote. it all up on purpose. Yeah. yeah. And then like the puppets we see are not running the show. Like they are the blame. It's just so easy to see. Like we don't, I don't think we know the names of the people that are running societies um, for a purpose. Cause why would they tell us their names? And, uh, and it makes it that much easier. Cause when you argue with someone that when you say they run the world, they just want to be like, they want names of these people. I'm just like, dude, I can't give you their names. Like mm -hmm. I could like the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, but like even them, like, I feel like they're really not like they're being told by someone else still at the, there's someone above them. I feel like yeah. I, mean, I could be wrong, but. Right. That's about as close as we can get to it. We'd have to strap them into a chair and do some James Bond style torture and try to <laughs> figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> who, is, who is directing you? Is it interdimensional yeah, exactly. entities beyond this realm? Are you in yeah. contact with giants at the North Pole? <laughs> yeah. What's your uh, What's your thoughts on giants? Just curious. Yeah. Well, I mean, there seems to be plenty of evidence that they at least existed at some point in history, and mm. and still to this day. I mean, giants in the sense of seven, eight, nine foot tall people we still have today, yeah, and then we've right. got ske skeletons of players. Yeah, people older than that, um, larger than that. So, I mean, in some sense giant giantism they call it they call it that now just like dwarfism so nowadays the dwarfs don't exist and giants don't exist but we got, yeah. we got the isms people yeah, that are left totally. over from it but i think and, um, uh, in like in the uh the mercator maps and the Urbit, Ur, urbante was it urbano monte map and some of those other old maps they talk about the lands at the north pole and the little inscriptions say that there are pygmies or like little people living there mm -hmm. and or giants so the, right. there's, um, you know, quite a precedent in written history also for people claiming that there are races of really tall and really yeah, small different. humans as well. Yeah, and they want you to think that all that stuff is just fairy tales and then like, but we can go to space like trillions of light <laughs> away. That's no problem, you right. know. No. Yeah, and I think paleo, like even like paleontologists, like I think their job is just to like, if they are even collecting bones at all, it's just to be collecting bones of the past, right? It's not dinosaurs or whatever the fuck they're telling us it is, or old monkey humans, or um, yeah, it's likely giant they could be human, covering human beings or other large yeah. animals. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, he's that uh, oh, paleontologist on Joe Rogan's show is talking about finding whale bones and stuff. So, yeah, they're just taking really large bones and then mix and matching them. Okay, yeah. got a dinosaur. We found some bones in the ground. Okay. <laughs> Like, I know, congratulations. I don't know. What to tell you. That's where animals go when they die, you know. And, like, and then I, I had someone show me evidence of like a big, it looked like a big elephant skull that they they dug out of the ground. I'm just like, that doesn't mean that was a woolly mammoth like 100 million years ago, dude. Like, it's just the crazy, they, they see something on the screen, they just want to believe it so bad. But it's, I don't know where they get it, but. And then and if you challenge like, like a mastodon or a woolly mammoth or a saber toothed tiger, these I don't I don't consider those dinosaurs necessarily. Those are just versions of pre existing animals and that sure there may be different adaptations of those. I'm not even saying that. The uh, the dinosaurs I'm claiming don't exist are these yeah. Tyrannosaurus and Brontosaurus, all these things that have nothing there's nothing like those uh, that exist today and there's really nothing that could exist like that just the way that they're structured uh, they wouldn't even be able to hold themselves up their bones would break yeah uh, they would break yeah, yeah. t-rex probably yeah. couldn't even get up after laying down i would imagine <laughs> yeah i heard one theory is that uh, the t-rex is uh, 
this is totally speculation that a T-Rex is actually more of a dragon. Like, I, I, I don't know if I believe in dragons so much just because you, you haven't seen it. Right. But it kind of makes sense. Like when you see a bird and they don't have the like the feathers and their wings and stuff, they have small, it looks like small little arms. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wonder if it's like they're trying to rub it in our face that, I don't know. It does kind of. I'd be more dragon. open to dragons than dinosaurs. The, yeah, again, exactly. the, there's a historical precedent for dragons before the 1800s. Nobody ever talked about a dinosaur before that. But, uh, you know, Marco Polo and a bunch of explorers talked about dragons existing. So there's at least record of that. And if there were a few dragons or large lizards, their bones around, and you wanted to create a narrative around that that worked in your evolution paradigm, well, there you go. You got to take these dragons and turn them into dinosaur pre prehistoric things that were once uh, roamed the earth, but now lo- no longer do, because um, that works perfectly with the narrative that they were trying to fit it, fit up. And likewise, why they have to now throw giant human being bones into the ocean, the Smithsonian does, because that doesn't fit with their evolution narrative. Yeah, it, yeah, it, and I feel like all this like government stuff, like. That w- one way I get people into talking about conspiracies, I talk about taxes, and they don't realize how much taxes they actually pay to the government. And then I show them like studies that they do. Like there's this famous study that American government did about giving cocaine to quails um, hmm. to see if they become more sexually active. You can look it up. But I'm just like, do you think they're actually doing this stuff of how much money that they're saying they're doing it? And like NASA, and like I can show them that all the globe pictures are fake and that none of it matches up on the map. I'm like, do you trust these people that we're paying 50% of our money to? Mm. I don't get why. And like, they think they would, they're, they're, why would they lie? I'm like, dude, 50% of your money. Like, that's, yeah. like, that's one. Like, Does anybody even say, like, no, I, I trust the government? When you, when you word it that way, doesn't pretty much 100% of the people yeah. agree with you? Yeah, exactly. And another way I'll do it, I'll be like, how much would you, like to pay in taxes before I'll even <laughs> how much they actually pay. And they'll say like 12 to 15 percent. And I'm like, oh, that's generous. Oh, that's generous. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, that's true. I wouldn't want to do that either. But I mean, if they were actually using the money for what they say they're going to, maybe. But yeah. like all like at 50 percent of everybody, our school should look like Hogwarts, you know, but exactly. they barely get funded at all. And it's just pre, you know, like the curriculum they want you to learn. You can't learn anything else. You know, if government uh, was voluntary and the services they provided were as good as a good charity, then for sure people would be fine with contributing a percentage of their income like that, including myself. But that yeah. um, has to be voluntary, just like any charity, and you have to be providing a legitimate service, just like any charity. Without those yeah. two things, uh, you shouldn't be getting any money. Yeah, I drive down the road and hit a pothole. Like, <laughs> don't fix anything. It's just like, where is this money going? Like, I can't fathom. And then when you die, if you saved any money, they take another 50% off the top, off what they already taxed you 50% on. Um, that so one's really like, insidious. The, uh, yeah, the inheritance tax. tax. Yeah. I can't stand then, that. Oh, you think, you know, like, they're using the, the to kill people. I'm like, why wouldn't they? Like, it's a, they need to rewrite the history. And then, well, if you die... They get 50% of your money. It's total, I don't know. I don't get why people couldn't see why they would want to lie to them or hurt them. Mm-hmm. They trust them. Yeah. And then uh, I watched your uh, video that you uploaded last night. Um, and you were talking about in in the dream theory, which I totally, I totally subscribe to. And uh, it's just, it makes so much sense that, like, in your dreams, like everything you create is literally your consciousness. It's nothing else. And what's different than that from here? It's like in the Matrix when they asked Neo if, if, have you ever had a dream so real that you it, that you didn't know it was real? And ha- and if you couldn't wake up from that dream, how would you know it was a dream? Mm. And Oh, but you were saying that, but if, if you are the creator and you're creating this world that nothing bad should happen, which I agree, like, why, why, why did all these, like, parasites and all these things that don't need to be in the world are here, right? But, mm. and, and we need to evolve to be deserving 
of living in a place without them. I don't get why the creator would decide to create beings and then mm -hmm. create them unevolved so so much so that they have to deserve living in a subpar realm for hundreds of thousands of lifetimes before deserving to evolve into some other special place that you have. Like, I don't right. know, it's just a really strange uh, thing, uh, place we find ourselves in here. And I don't know if people give that too much thought yeah, and it gave me a lot of thought. And the, the the only explanation I can think of for that is that you have to have the extremes of bad and good to realize how good something can possibly be. You have to have the comparable on the bad side. Because if you only had good, you wouldn't even know good. Just like if you were only in hot water, you never touch cold water. You wouldn't even know you're in hot water because that's all you know. Right. So I feel like you have to have the yin and the yang for you to realize one or the other. I don't think he does it to punish us in any way it's just to show it's I, I feel like he made a creation just like he wants to experience both good and bad the lows and the highs that's my that's my opinion on it it's that you have to have both both sides yeah. but I, no. and so considering if you had to have both sides i wonder to what extent though do you need the negativity like how much negativity do you need to be able to appreciate the positivity? And if you think about how much negativity is here, is that how much is necessary? And I like this thought experiment. If you, if I could give you uh, an hour of the most pleasurable experience available to people here on Earth, and whatever that means to you personally, so it could be some sexual thing, could be you know some uh, travel, some adventure whatever you know excites you the most whatever to you would bring the most happiness to you the most pleasure for one hour i give that thing to you but after you experience that most pleasurable thing on earth to you for one hour i get to do to you the most torturous thing i can think of for one hour and i'm talking medieval torture devices i'm talking about you know all the things that have been done to people. Uh, I'm thinking of examples, but I think I'm going to get kicked off YouTube if I even give examples. So people use your imagination yeah. about the, the tortures that have been done to people throughout history. They are <laughs> atrocious. And can you imagine living through even five minutes or an hour? Now, yeah. now answer my question. If I were to, you know, you, you could have the most amazing orgy or whatever with the most beautiful women ever for an hour but afterwards i'm gonna t torture you medieval style the the, the most depraved okay. things i can think of for an hour would you do it yeah probably not five minutes you get the hour orgy but five minutes of medieval torture afterwards would and it's you do not it? death not death no you're still fine after oh, not fine five <laughs> minutes of <laughs> excruciating no, towards uh, yeah. right no that's a good so, point i mean i agree i can't think i don't even know what the pleasurable thing would be yeah. you know yeah some sexual thing i guess whoop de doo you know it's it's over in five seconds i mean the, the most pleasurable part and then <laughs> and then, and then <laughs> no i'm not that slow ladies yeah <laughs> i'll give you some time beforehand but i'm just wait, talking wait. about the best part but anyway yeah. um, <laughs> no almost nobody would would take that uh offer and to me what that is saying about this realm is that the potential of negativity and evil and just downright awfulness that exists in this realm right doesn't counterbalance the positivity even so i get the yin yang idea and the thing that yeah we need to have negative to be able to know what positive is to be able to appreciate it and so I can I can jive with that a little bit, but then my next problem is this right here. Well, how much negativity is necessary? Because this world is full of pain, extreme pain. Some people are born in pain and die in pain, and they live in pain their entire lives, and they wonder why they were born. You know, they wonder what this creation is more than me. And so, um, yeah, that that's my big question. Because I do agree with your what you said about like. How would you even know what positivity and pleasure and happiness is if you don't have the opposite at, yeah. at your fingertips there? Um, so 
I agree with that, but then I, I got this one further question that brings me right back to square one, where it's like, okay, but even then, look at what's going on here. This is too yeah. much. This, it doesn't the need to be to this, way this, lower to this degree. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep. So, um, well, I was also wanted to ask you, um, at what point in history do you believe what they are even telling you? Because at this point, I don't, I don't believe like even 1776. I get a lot of I get a lot of hate from that because I used to be like quote unquote Republican or whatever, and I'm not anymore. I'm an anarchist. I would call myself now, and uh, I get a lot of hate for that, saying that 1776. You know, the U.S. is just a corporation all this stuff and like if they've been lying to us to our face for what we're alive for like what then why wouldn't they have just made up everything else to begin with you know mm. and uh and just thinking about all these like old buildings in washington dc like how and they, they said they built that in the 1800s mm. like with wagons and horses like on a swamp like dude like it's just like so in your face i've actually spoken with santos Bonacci, and he told me he thinks it's an IQ test, whereas it, it, it's so stupid where <laughs> anybody that has common sense can figure it out and then they won't trust their government and they won't accidentally hurt themselves. Whereas like anyone that trusts the government's going to thin the herd for them <laughs> and uh, they believe everything. Whereas like if they make it so stupid, they want us to figure it out. They, they want us to connect the dots. And I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> makes a lot of sense because sometimes i'm like how do you guys believe this stuff like i know i used to believe it like it was like two years ago i think i found your videos and uh now i can't believe i ever fell for it but mm -hmm. i mean when you're asleep you just don't know i mean mm -hmm. so yeah that's tough this it's like a trigger that happens in people's heads and you can't necessarily set it off it's like no matter how many seeds you try to plant in somebody's head how well you you're, you are spoken or you sit them down to watch a great documentary you give them a book some people if it's just not their time yet it's like there's there's a wall yeah. in their head and they will just they'll have just one thing for instance you know well i saw um a, the curvature out the window when i was on pan am blah 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 and that no matter what you say no matter they'll just have that yeah. in their heads until one day when they're maybe they go back up in a plane or maybe they're having an introspective moment by themselves yeah, and they it, it clicks for them that wait a minute this one thing that i think i remember actually doesn't trump all the hours of talking i've been doing with my friend and the documentary he showed me and but it, it takes time for that to click it's it's something that just doesn't happen instantly for anybody almost anybody and um and you can't force it you just kind of gotta like subtly yeah. plant the seed and and wait cross your fingers that's what i do with a lot of people and uh, mm -hmm. the, the the level water one's my favorite. Like, like you okay? Because I work in construction, so like I work with a lot of people that use water levels. And I'm like, so what do we use to make sure this desk is you know flat, you know flat and level? They're like, oh, a level. So what's in that level that makes it level? Water. Okay, so <laughs> water is self leveling, right? I'm like, they can agree with that. I'm like, okay, if the Earth is 71% water, and water is self leveling, what is the Earth? And then they, like sometimes you can see it almost click in their brain and it, make, it makes them ask a lot more questions. I'm just like, when do you have ever seen water not level itself out? And like, and I gave, I give an example of uh, when you see reflections across of like uh, lakes and they, it's like that glass reflection where it's a perfect, there's no distortion in the image. Um, whereas like if you were in a fun house, like in a, at a carnival, those they have those mirrors in there that change the way you look just by walking in front of them but it's because the the reflection is curved mm. and it's distorting the the image but so how could the lake be reflecting a perfect image of the mountains behind it if there's right. eight inches per mile like it should have a distortion to it easily yeah like, yeah right. it really gets people to think so uh, only a flat surface can give a perfect reflection like that, whether it's on a lake or in that, um, what is it called, Sailor de Uni, the salt flat yeah, goes on for flat. hundreds of miles or something. Yeah, and it's pulled. just, yeah. I mean, the, there's no curvature happening there. It's 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 literally like a mirror for as far as you can go when the, after it's rained. Um, 
that, that's a great proof right there of the flat earth. People got to yeah. really close their eyes to reality to be able to see that and not understand it. Yeah. They like to pick at the math too. It's like, oh, eight inches per mile, that, uh, that's a par parabola. And, yeah. and th <laughs> therefore, therefore, it's not true. It's like, okay, the, first of all, it's your formula, not ours. That <laughs> simplification <laughs> works up, up to like 300 miles for any practical purposes. It's exactly right. Um, so even using the para parabolic formula, um, it's fine. And if you use the regular formula, but you get the same same statistics, it's, it's the exact same amount of drop, all, uh, you know, up until about 300 miles, and then it starts to deviate. Yeah. But uh, yeah, people act and, and like it's some gotcha. Eric, did you know so, that's a parabola? It's like, okay, but but can you see a hundred miles away? <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, it, it's only three you, miles. Like you can right, even Google it, miles, and I love six. Yeah, feet. it says yeah. three miles. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Without uh, without any zoom capability, they say that the horizon's like three miles away, and um, based on any formula you use, that means there should be six feet of curvature visible already, and that, yeah. that's exponentially bigger as you as you go, and people can see for hundreds of miles uh, at altitude. We've seen over a thousand miles now. Using Zoom technology and uh, it's like an infrared, uh, yeah, infrared uh, cameras. Technology. There's hundreds of miles of missing curvature at that point, and people are yeah. still like, "Well, maybe the Earth's just really big." No, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah, no. And uh, yeah, like nothing would work on a globe like sonar or radar. Like, like you can't have waves bounce over, like curve around a ball. Like, it just makes so much sense when you figure it out. And then you really wake up to everything. Like, you, I stopped watching news completely. Like, I feel like if it's on the news, it's just fake. Like, I can't remember the last time I watched something. Maybe some good, you know, like, your local news has, like, a good feel story. That might be real. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but anything big and they push it in your face, they're all repeating the same thing. And, uh, yeah. yeah it's, quite it's hard to get people... The news wait, is wait, people. propaganda. Mm -hmm. You've seen those clips where they, they intersperse like 20 or 40 different newscasters all saying the exact same script. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, sh I show that to a lot of people. That wakes people up. And it's like, it even has my local uh, casters in it, which is hilarious. They're, it's like one of the fourth people in. I'm like, damn. <laughs> I'm like, and, uh, and I didn't really look into any conspiracies until COVID. I mean, everything locked down. I got bored. I mean, I probably would have if I talk to the right people but nobody really brought it up or anything i got locked up at home mm. got bored started watching videos and then now i'm here and uh, i always thought the face mask thing I, I i did do the face mask thing for a little bit just because like i didn't know any better and i felt like as soon as like the first week went by i'm like this is stupid like <laughs> it's like saying that like my underpants is going to protect from me farting on somebody. <laughs> it's, like, it's just like your common sense overrides their nonsense. And uh, well, for, for you, that's that's good. Uh, yeah, most uh, this, this is half the population here is still wearing them every freaking day. <laughs> oh, over there. <laughs> yeah, it's great that you figured it out in a week. But man, some people yeah. three years in still still scared still of the, boog the boogie flu. Yeah. yeah. There's some people, I, I, I talk to a lot of people that buy houses from us, and uh, sometimes they're buying a house from us, so they have to be doing semi-well, but they'll be asking the most basic questions. And I'll be like, how are you even alive at this point? <laughs> and you're buying a house. <laughs> I was like, you have so much money, and you don't even know how to change a light bulb. I was like, I don't even know. But, yeah, critical but, thinking uh, you know, doesn't do so well as far as your success, ma material wealth and success in this world is concerned. Yeah. It's like exactly. the more of an the more of an NPC you are, uh, the more likely you are to do well in this society, and yeah, you, <laughs> yeah. more likely you are to be buying one of those new houses and a bit more asking those stupid it. questions to the construction worker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and if you know what's going on, they just punish you. Right. <laughs> and uh, there's an old child remedy, re re or melody, not remedy. Melody is uh, the row, row, row your bell got me down the stream merrily 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 life is but a dream and 
it's just so weird that it's in your face. Like, it feels like they want you to know the truth. Or, like, I don't even know where this actually came from, like, their origins of that song. But it, I think that's basically telling you to, like, don't rush your life. Just, like, steadily go down, the, like, gently go down the stream. Do what you need to do. Don't take life so seriously because it is just a dream. Mm. And And when you have dreams and you... I don't know if you've ever had a nightmare or a dream, but you realize in the middle of it that you are dreaming. And it's kind of like a great awakening point in your dream, even though you don't fully awaken, like out of your dream. But you realize that no, none of this stuff really matters. Like, it's just a dream. You're going to be okay, right? And I feel like that's the same way The same way you feel when you realize you are dreaming now. Like, it kind of, I don't know about you, but for me, it it's a relief, like, what you are like your spirit your soul will live on internally whatever like it, it could be a soul trap we could come here just die over and over again whatever and yeah that's horrible but the the other side of the coin where we could just not exist at all i, I think i'd rather have a life with some negatives to it than the the point of just you know nothing exists right but yeah, yeah. Especially if you existed and then you have to be annihilated and does not exist anymore. And then yeah. living with, with knowing that that would happen would be the most depressing thing ever. I thought of that as a kid as I was questioning uh, religion and atheism and all that. It just seemed like, wow, that is the most depressing thing ever. Like someday my every all my experiences, my consciousness, my memory, everything will just be gone. And my body will be like six feet under and there's no continuation of consciousness. I would think about that forever until I, I I thought of the fact that, well, wait a minute, before I was born, uh, I was in a state of non-existence and then I came into existence here and now I'm, I'm worrying about after death that there's going to be a state like that of non-existence. Well, the most you could say about that state of non-existence is it is the potential for existence because that soup that created me is would be what I go back to. Uh, yeah. So it's not like energy is never created or destroyed type of thing. It's like, so when you think about it, even if you're like trying to be an atheist or like I was trying to consider the atheist position, which is like this, like your consciousness magically comes into um, being when you're born, but then upon death, it, it's gone forever. That's what they would think because they have a materialist explanation for everything. But even if you have a materialist explanation for everything, somehow the mystery of life happens at conception or birth and consciousness and your thoughts and your emotions and your memories and everything happens out of that nothingness. And then when you die, you go back to that nothingness. So how is that really nothing? It's really a potential infinite anything. And that got rid of my existential despair where I was just feeling really bad about the possibility of potentially being my consciousness being annihilated and then once yeah. i thought of that it's like well even if my consciousness was annihilated it's just it just goes back into the space that everything would have come out of in that philosophy so huh, it's just a, a pool of infinite anything that's fine yeah yeah and it's uh it's funny how people can believe that we came from nothing but like they think of like a creator as like the crazy thing. Like, like I used to be atheist. I used to think it was kind of crazy. And just because like, like when you read when you take the Bible literally, it does seem kind of crazy. But when you realize it's not supposed to be taken literally, it makes a lot more sense. And I'm not even saying the Bible's like perfect by any means, like or any text is. But like the stories make a lot more sense. Like I do you, I know you did not uh, videos on jesus not being a, an actual person um and that that's another one that gets people like i've even talked to people that are into flat earth now but they're still on the fence like when i talk to them about oh jesus you know is it, it's a parable it's a bunch of parables like you're not eating the son of god you know like i i believe what the the book is saying is that jesus is the son of god uh, he gives us the light to grow the wheat to make the bread. We're not literally eating a man like cannibalism, like when we're eating the crackers and stuff. Uh, and a lot of people have a hard time with like, and Easter made me think of this, like 
and I see a lot of like pictures of like like people hanging like actual people up on crosses to worship Jesus. And I feel like the the man of Jesus is a, a way to get you to worship a, a man like a man on on earth, which is technically in the Bible blasphemy, where you can't worship a physical man, only the creator itself. Mm-hmm. But people keep it, yeah, I don't it's that's even harder than flat earth, I think. But. They also talk about idol worship, and then they wear a Jesus cross. <laughs> and made <laughs> idol. Yeah. yeah, and the, the cross, or like, of all the moments of Jesus' supposed life, like, that's the one you want to remember? <laughs> it's a really <laughs> weird If, if that's the story to believe, where he physically was hung on a cross, <laughs> uh, yeah, why would you choose his death to remember him? Yeah, exactly. Like that, Bill Hicks had a, a quote about that. He's like, it's like going to Jackie Kennedy with a with a little pendant on that has a rifle and just being like, just thinking of, just thinking of John, Jackie. <laughs> why, why on earth would that be the symbol that you wear if you are a Christian and profess to being a lover of this character and stuff? It's like weird. <laughs> but when you realize where the origins of that sign came from, like it comes from, I, I, what, what I, I could be wrong. But from my understanding, that the the sun on the cross comes from the the zodiac, the where the the zodiac chart where the sun is in the middle of the zo- the twelve the twelve zodiacs, and then the the sun on the cross is the son of God. That's that's from my understanding, at least. Exactly, exactly. So you've got the twelve apostles around a circle, right. and then in astrology, you've got the four cardinal signs, which are every yeah. three, and and it's the same with like the Leonardo da Vinci painting of the the Last Supper, they've got them all grouped into three people, three people, three people, and then the one in the middle is the Son of God, Jesus. And so those are the seasons, the three months of each season, or the the, the four cardinal uh, astrological signs, like we're saying. Um, so yeah, it absolutely is that, but um, people don't want to take it that way. Like every sentence in the Bible should be read metaphorically. The person reading every sentence should think for themselves, what could this mean if it didn't mean literally what it says on this page? If you read the Bible that way, it's you're just going to, it'll open your mind to so much more. And that's the way it was meant to be read. I think yeah. people nowadays, I think, are so dumb to look back at our ancient ancestors and these these highly metaphorical scriptures that they wrote and to think that it's 100% literal and that that's what they meant. It's like yeah. the way it's written, like, have you actually read the book? Like, you really <laughs> think that they they want you to believe to the letter every single, the way it's written? It's like, not at all. Like, the names, the places, the events, almost everything is referring to spiritual, like, it, it's presented as a historical narrative, like historical fiction, but every, thing that happens every parable it's like these two twins one was the good twin one was the evil twin he did this and And it's like oh did that really happen okay and then here we got the two sisters and these two sisters did this and that almost every story in the bible is clearly an allegory and it and in within the allegory is given the good example and the bad example sometimes they literally use twins or stuff like that to make it super obvious for for literalists that don't understand metaphors. But even then, they're like, no, it was a real twin, Cain and Abel, and then they had sex with their mother because she was the only woman on earth at the time, I guess. I don't know. I'm taking things so literally now. Yeah. yeah exactly. At some point, you, like if you, when, you, when you really consider the Bible, at some point you have to admit that certain things must be metaphorical. Otherwise, you back yourself into these contradictory, paradoxical corners. And then the, the question always becomes, well, how much is metaphorical? And then and that's what I get in my comment section all day. It's like, no, Eric, th- this isn't metaphorical, but that is. And Eric, you say the earth is flat and the Bible says the earth is flat. Therefore, you can't say the Bible's metaphorical because this this part of it is literal. Yeah. Like, they have <laughs> one, one example of it being literal. Yeah. yeah um, I mean, humans exist in the Bible and humans exist on earth. Therefore, the Bible is literal. Like, that's the <laughs> level they're at at this point. Yeah. Like, they mention but, an animal. Like, yeah, it, it's it's a bit deeper than that, certainly. 
Um, and if you're reading the Bible on the level of it's a historical narrative of things that happened from the beginning of time up until present day, you're absolutely missing out on a bunch of things because the Bible, it's based on a bunch of religions that pre-existed <laughs> these scriptures. Yeah, and so if you're like, like most Christians and you, you won't read any of those ancient texts because you think that they're from the devil and the devil came before Jesus to plant those fake religions. That's, I get that one all the time too. And they're like, do you know there's 16 religions that have a Jesus-like figure before Christianity? Yes, the devil created those religions before Jesus came so that you wouldn't believe the one true religion. Wow. It's a lot of people yeah. <laughs> that say yeah, that with a, a straight face. They to totally believe that. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> it's so crazy. And it's 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 a whole hate thing. It's the get us to hate each other. It's the end of it. And uh, and another great one in the in the Bible, they try to push that uh, like Jesus is a carpenter, and uh, which is like like what what. The sun in the sky literally provides us with the light that we need to. It literally carpens our world, like while it travels across, like it grows all the stuff we need. It grows everything, and it, and it also says that we can only return to the Creator through Jesus. And you and you and you've witnessed in uh, near death experiences that you see the light at the end of the tunnel, which I I don't know. This is all speculation, obviously, but I think when your soul leaves back to the creator that what you're seeing is that and that light at the end of the tunnel is the son of God. And mm -hmm. that maybe that it's like a, an in and out kind of like a portal. Um, Cause when you look at it, when it's like low in the sky and you can actually stare at it, it has like a hard edge to it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I'm just speculating. It kind of does look like a portal when it is low in the sky and you can actually stare at it. But mm -hmm. this is speculation. And, uh, Jesus is the light of this world. Right? Yeah, exactly. What's and I see a lot of, of people. <laughs> I see yeah. a lot of people post pictures, and it's even got like Jesus in the in the sky, you know, and it's got the light behind them, and they just can't like put two and two together that they just changed one letter and it fooled everybody, you know. <laughs> S O N instead of S U N, you know. It's just like it's just like it's the crazy. plane and the planet. They just change one letter, add a T yeah. to plane, and suddenly Earth is a spinning globe. Yeah. change the sun to a sun and suddenly you've got this miraculous deity figure that <laughs> that uh, dies for three days and then is resurrected once per year <laughs> yeah. on December 25th. <laughs> yeah, in Easter just happening, I was like, I explained why Easter During happens. Yeah. yeah, the spring, it's like when salvation, right? Like he comes back and resurrects the dead plants and like he heals the sick with his, the vitamin D and it's it makes so much more sense. Like but yeah, then a, the man was sent here from God, impregnated a virgin. Um, I think what, what, I, what they've I, brilliantly I, done though is they've they've taken a like a a story of someone a, a human who lives his life perfectly through adverse conditions, and that's what the crucifixion is. I think that's what the story of Jesus is. Is it's basically saying this world is you know. Not, not so great. I mean, that's what the story says to me. This world is so terrible that it, even if you were the son of God, the most perfect being, and you lived your life with perfect compassion, trying to help everyone around you, this world crucifies you for doing that. This world hates people like that, which makes me feel like, wow, it's like the Bible's main message to me is telling me this world is basically hellish. And the way to get out of hell is to live your life like Jesus. And when you do that, you're gonna to be tortured. Your life is not gonna be great. Like you noticed, the NPCs of this world are the ones buying your houses. They're the ones that make it in the material realm. But if you live your life like Jesus and you be compassionate and you try to actually help the world, what's gonna to happen to you? You're gonna live in a big mansion and, and make it in this world? No, you're gonna be literally killed for trying to help by, by the people you're trying to help. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like, that's Harley, what this world does uh, to yeah. those who, who want to help you. And that's the main message of the Bible. And and who is that talking about? Is it talking about some dude 2000 years ago? Or is it talking about, you know, yeah, you. it's yeah. us 
Like, the Bible, it doesn't have any meaning to anyone if it's just some supernatural dude from 2,000 years ago. Yeah. The whole point is, what, what, how does it relate to us and our experience? And yeah. that's why you have to read the Bible metaphorically, and you have to relate everything that happens to the characters in the Bible to yourself and your own life, and how that works nowadays. Because all the situations that are happening in the Bible, and supposedly they happened in history thousands of years ago, they're still happening now. They're happening in different ways, updated methods, upgraded, refined versions of them in 2023. And if you read the Bible that way, you get way more out of it. And it's a much more fruitful endeavor. I would recommend people read the Bible if they can read it in this this way. Same with the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita. I like religious scriptures. That's the funny thing. People think that I'm like super anti-religion, but I've actually read all your scriptures and I like them all. Yeah, and there's, there's I, something I, I, to be said for all of them. My big problem is people who read one scripture say this is the literal truth 100% and everything outside of it is a false doctrine and created by Satan or whatever. That's yeah. I don't I don't like that. I like open mind, look at everything and then use your intuition and discernment to decide for yourself what you think after you've seen all the available evidence. Yeah, exactly. Um, Oh, and on your other video, you were talking about um, the firmament, which I totally agree. Like, we can't go there. We can't touch it. We don't know what it is. It's all speculation. But one proof that I feel like kind of proves that I wouldn't even call it that it's a firmament. Like, I don't know what it is. But the fact that we have air pressure to begin with at all, I feel like we have to have a container, right? Like, like propane, like to have pressurized propane. Like you have to have the container. You don't have the container to pressurize. Like you need something for the for it to push off of, for it to create pressure, right? Um, that, that's a very good point. Yeah, I just feel like that's the only proof that I have. Like other than like, yeah, we can't touch it. We, other than that, like we, I don't know where if it comes down in Antarctica or if it goes further. That's all speculation. I don't know, but I feel like it just be nothing up there doesn't. It's hard for me to drive with that, but. Yeah, like you said, air pressure is definitely uh, very good evidence for the fact that we must be enclosed in something. Um, something. And, and if not, it would mean that there's some some physical law that we're unaware of that is allowing for that. So, I mean, those yeah. are the only two possibilities. Yeah, they're hiding it from us. We can't go check it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, oh, but anyway, back to the question about... Uh, uh, what like so what history do you believe it was real like i know you like quote some older stuff in your your videos but like how do you decide on because i feel like history is like the game of telephone i don't know if you ever played that in elementary school where you have like 20 kids they repeat they're supposed to repeat the same sentence into their ear and it goes down the line and by the time it reaches the last kid it's all jacked up it's not mm -hmm. even close to the original saying um and so one of the kids could have totally just changed the saying right in the middle of the line. You wouldn't even known. Right. Um, and all it is is his story. <laughs> yeah, his story. Yeah, his story. And so, yeah, you're right. Um, I don't necessarily think that. So, so, yeah, I talk about history. I study history. And if I'm writing about something like the history of Flat Earth, then I have to um, use what they know, give you. Use what, uh, but if you ask me, after I've just described Eratosthenes and these experiments and such, uh, is it possible that Eratosthenes just didn't exist and these experiments are mythologized things that have just been created? Absolutely possible. So I'm, yeah, I'm absolutely open to the pretty much the entirety of history being falsified. And when I talk about history, I'm literally talking about his story. Well, this is the story. This is the mainstream story, and here's how it is. But I am absolutely open to the fact, uh, especially a lot of these um, heliocentric astronomy figures um, potentially not actually have even existing. They could have just been, you know, Freemasons or something along these lines. And they, yeah, like ghostwritten. They, they ghostwrite these books. And like, for instance, like Copernicus's book wasn't published until after his death. So if you, if you got a, a book that's published after somebody dies, like, where is there even any proof that this person is the person who wrote it? And then you, us, 500 years afterwards, how do we have any proof that this person was even a person? We, yeah. You know? 
So, so it's like, well, there's no proof that they even existed. Just cartoon drawings of them. Right. And, uh, same with all of our old presidents. I'm like, I don't even know when all this. I don't know. Like at this point, like you just have to be in the boat of I don't know, mm. and you can all speculate on it. But I don't believe what they're telling me. Whatever the narrative is, I know not to believe. It. You know, as you said that, it just made me think. It's like, you know, it would be so great if everyone could just get on the same level with is what you just said. How like just accept that nobody really knows, and just nobody knows nobody knows what happens after we die nobody knows what god is really nobody knows what the true religion would be nobody knows um who's the tippy top of the capstone of the conspiracy and the illuminati pyramid there's so many of these but but how many people think they know and then have whole channels and books and debates and everything dedicated to trying to make everyone else believe the way they believe when if everyone was super honest, we would all have to admit that actually none of us know any of these things. And if we had that all as a baseline humanity, if we all could humble ourselves enough to be at that level, then we could just be like our own scientists. We could get back to basics and everybody realize that we all have to be our own authorities and we can never get to ultimate truth but we can all work together at getting closer and closer to what should be, the, what could be the truth. It's like as long as we're all divided into these camps of these religions and political factions yeah. and stuff, oh, Republican, Democrat, Islam, Christian, it's like human? How about we just go back to we're all people and none of us know what's going on. None of us know the perfect way to have a political system. None of us know what happens after we die. So stop getting into these groups, like I said earlier, groups are a problem. When you have a, a grouping, it results in too much power and too little responsibility. So get back to individuals and individuals just trying to, we're all trying to figure it out ourselves. Don't all group together and be like, oh, we believe in this thing and we're all gonna fight against people who believe in that thing. So many examples of that in the political sphere and the religious sphere and yeah, it's still going That's on. Fair. And uh, even I see like truthers that know the earth's flat, but they still fall for the political charade, which is kind of mind blowing to me. Um, like a good example is uh, I watch Eddie Bravo's podcast a lot and I like his content, like 99% of it's good. But it seems like every time he wants to talk conspiracies now, he wants to bring up how Trump is still going to save us from everything. And I, I'm not I'm not on that boat. But, Same. um, and that uh, he like he tries to vouch for him on like why he needed to rush the the shot out so fast and like it's to stop the the vaccine passports and all that, and it's just like man, it it seems like he's like almost like the final gatekeeper. I don't even want to really call him <laughs> that, but like like when you get to the very end, you know, like Eddie Bravo, like he's the one that really got me into you. Like I found him on the. Uh, I think it was Alex Jones first, but like they, he had like David Weiss on with Alex Jones on Infowars, and that was the first thing I I, I think I found on Flat Earth. And uh, so I like Eddie Bravo, but like it feels like he's there to push. I don't know, maybe he actually believes it, but it feels like he's there to to make us still believe that we need a someone to vote for. It feels like it's like a trick to to get you to wait every four years for a savior. And like, just keep waiting. It's gonna happen this next four years, you know. Um, we promise. <laughs> no, I'm with you there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I don't. I mean, as far as his rhetoric and the way he is, Trump. Um, I, I'd take Trump over most of the presidents that we've had uh, recently. Um, but right. he, that's that's just all that speaks to is how good he is at playing that game. Yeah. He's really great. At making Americans think he's on your side, and, oh. uh, but but ultimately, is he on your side or is he on his own side and the side of his, you know, the people who put him into power and kept him there? The idea that he's this anti-establishment figure, yet he's a multi-billionaire who's been on, he's had his own television show, he's been on like WCW wrestling before, he's but yeah, he had that show where he's firing everybody and 
and he's got he owns all this land in Vegas and everywhere else. Like he is the exact opposite of anti-establishment. He's as establishment as it gets. It's just that he has this great way of speaking, his mannerisms and everything that really resonates with people in this day and age. And that has gotten him so far. But when you really look at what he's done and the campaign promises versus what has actually happened, he's a liar, just like all of them. He's told yeah. so many lies and you can't look past that. And uh, yeah, people like Eddie seem happy to look past all these things and make excuses for him over and over again. But uh, eventually people seem to run out of excuses. My, my parents, uh, a lot of people I've known that we're on the Trump train. It's like over time, it's like you, you start getting tired of making excuses for other people. And that's again, back to the grouping thing. It's like, why do we need representatives in big groups to look after us? Why can't we all just be in our, our ourselves? Like, can I represent myself in a political system in this day and age with the internet and, and everything? Um, and more so at, that would be at a bigger scale. Like I was saying in the other podcast on a smaller scale, the only thing that matters is in your community level anyway. The only thing that's applicable to you is the people around you. So governance shouldn't, there shouldn't be large scale governance. Even the, the size countries are at this point, I think it's too big. You should get back to, you know, towns should be about the biggest scale size government, I think that should exist. Yeah, they want you on the grid. They want you all in small little pins, basically, on the grid. I hate that you can't just, like, go get a piece of land. There's so much empty land. Like, why is, like, homesteading so frowned upon? And and if you do it, you have to abide by their rules. Like, they're going to come check your property out. They're going to know you did it. Um, If you try to, like, go live on your own, you're still not getting away from it. It's just a trap. And I feel like, yeah. uh, I think it was Henry David Thoreau. Back like 170 years ago, he tried to do an experiment. Or Rolf, I don't remember if it was Rolf Waldo Emerson or Henry David Thoreau now, because I like both of them and they're both uh, contemporaries. But one of them, the one that wrote Walden, uh, they went out into the woods somewhere that they thought they wouldn't be found and tried to do an experiment homesteading and trying to survive on their own, not paying taxes, not buying the land, and seeing if they could survive that way and and what would happen and this is so we're talking 170 years ago somebody trying to do this he only lasted like two or three years before the government found him <laughs> so, <laughs> they're gonna back charge you yeah and, and so imagine us trying to do this now like oh. you, you'd be found out instantly yeah if that uh... Uh, yeah, and thrown in jail, and I think he was as well, if I remember right. And that's awful. Like we're all born here, we all need to live somewhere. Yet there's this entity called government that doesn't even exist. There's no th- you can't point to it. But this thing has so much power that it's prevented everyone from being able to just be be, free. be somewhere. Like I like this area. Nobody else is here in this area. Nobody's built anything in this area. I want to, I'm going to take some tools, cut down some trees, build a house, going to plant some food. Huh, this is my area now. I'm going to live in this area. And then suddenly, some people you've never met before with uniforms just descend down on you with dogs and helicopters and whatever. And you're like, what the hell is going on here? And they're like, this is our area. <laughs> what? Who are you? It's like, have you ever been here before? Nope. But this is ours. Yeah. So, why it is. Well, why? Because it's it's humans that have been deluded by this idea of government and thinking that that's a good job and that they're a good person if they get that job. And this is the voluntarist discussion that really needs to happen on a large scale, because all government jobs are your your paycheck comes from the taxes that you, your uh, population is forced to pay, and so that's what all statist governments do. And because of that, everyone who works for a statist government, which is what all governments are currently, is immoral. You're being immoral. You're doing something, you're stealing. You're stealing from all of us. And I'm talking to, you know, public school teachers, military soldiers, police, politicians. 
and right down to your 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 you know lowly government job where you're a secretary office worker, but you get your government pension and you get all that. Is you all of you people are in the mafia, and you're extorting all of us. Yep. And you don't even know it. You think you're just part of some. And, and, oh, well, you need to have a government. Everything's fine. No, nope. you are. You're literally like uh, in the Italian mafia, shaking people down, going house to house, burning houses down if they don't pay you. And yep. you don't even know it. You have no idea you're doing that. You think that you're a public school teacher and you're you're educating kids. You think you're a politician. You're trying to bring freedom. You think you're a policeman and you're trying to be a hero and save people. You're a military person. You're trying to save the country there is that everyone has that the problem is is that you have taken that good aspect of yourself that you want to help the world and you've given it to a faceless organization that is simultaneously raping the world so you know if you want to be a cop you want to be a hero you're simultaneously saving some guy while stealing from him imagine if so if you if you get a robber you know you catch a robber and then you, you get the money back and then you take your paycheck and you go back home. What have you even done? <laughs> you, you stopped the this guy from stealing from this convenience store. Meanwhile, you stole from everyone else in the population, and you're back home, not yeah, realizing I, that you, that you're a robber. Yeah, you're a robber yourself. Yeah, but right. they they think it's like well, they get you to like like the whole back to blue and stuff. They want you to like think it's like an admiral job to do that. And uh, pulling people over for seatbelt tickets. I, I, I agree that there are some laws like murder and there's very like rape and stuff like there. There is laws that should be enforced, but there's a lot. Most of the laws are just to steal money from the population. Right. Like, yeah, like and and, and a police officers majority work every day, day in, day out is getting that money for for the government. There is yeah. very little police work, which is actually heroic and, and being mm -hmm. a hero. Though I'll admit that, I mean, that they are, some of them, and then the situations I put in, I'll say, I mean, military and police, so, you know, policemen, military, people who put their life on the line to defend other people, that is heroic. Oh, yeah, for I sure. I don't want to, I'm not saying that they're not heroes in that sense. The problem is, is that they didn't use their brain before they started using their body to save everybody. And the way that they're saving people, is simultaneously hurting everyone. That's a problem. You know, yeah. as, as a military man, taking taking money that's stolen from your countrymen to go kill people overseas. Yeah. Versus versus say a militia member, which is a person who also wants to defend the country, but they do it by staying at home and not taking any stolen money. Right. That's so the difference between militia and military. Militia, yeah. I'm all for. If we all had. Uh, guns and, and groups of people who trained and, and defended their area. You don't even need a military anymore. Who's gonna, who's going to attack a country that has like the entire citizenry is armed and practices as a militia? That is how every country should be anyway. And then you don't need a military. You don't even need a government. You know, yeah. when we get back to actual voluntarist ideas and and having the freedom to live the way we would anyway uh, without all these laws. For sure people would have, you know, if you had your the homestead thing we're talking about, you build your house, start building your, your, your um, planting your food and everything, you're not gonna defend that? Yeah, if guns Probably. exist, you're not gonna buy one? Like to, to defend all the work you've done and everything, of course, and your life and your family? Of course, but now so many places, you can't even own a gun, uh, you know, in the world. And well, I mean, I, I'm not for violence, but uh, you know, I don't like yeah. guns, but my pro protection. problem, but protection, the problem is, is if it's out there, if it exists in the world and evil people can get a hold of it, well, good people need to have it too. Otherwise, the evil people are going to have a monopoly on violence and kill all the good people. That's the That's first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. If you read that, another great scripture, but you got to read it as a metaphor because it's equally as applicable now as it was to, when, you know, if and when that ever happened in history. I don't think it did. It's just like all the Bible books and Story. everything, the stories, they they make sense in a metaphorical context. They sound historical, they, they write it that way so that it actually has a, it has to, I mean, otherwise we're gonna, it has to have some fantasy setting in some far off <laughs> dimension yeah. or something. I mean, it makes sense to have your parables relevant to the 
the world we're in and the historical period in which they were written. So that's why they're all that way. That doesn't mean that they're all literal history, though. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. People take everything way too literal, and that's why we're all stuck in this uh, situation we're stuck in. Mm. And a, another good one I bring up to people when I'm talking to their taxes is is, is, is if a hundred if taking a hundred percent of someone's earnings is slavery, at what percentage is it not slavery? And I know it's not fifty percent. So like I I it's hard to like get to people to accept that they're a slave just because of like the whole like saying that you're a slave is kind of like taboo because of, they they drill that whole America's racist all that fit into you like in school and stuff but it's like it's almost like we are always just all slaves they just made us think only one genre of people were but yeah open yeah. uh free range slaves <laughs> yeah free range yeah that's very, very we, we, were, we were probably more um controlled at some point and then they realized that free range slaves work a lot better let them have their own let them choose their own occupation <laughs> yeah yeah, for sure. And they it's still like work for us. They still work for us anyway. Yeah, as long as you keep them entertained, they're not going to do anything. I can't remember the actual quote. That's it's like some old quote: "Bread and circuses, and they'll never revolt." I think is what it is. Yeah. Um, yep. So true. And I feel like I don't know your uh, idea on this, but I, I think Caesar, or even the Roman Empire, is kind of tied into the whole Tataria thing, where we have all these old buildings around everywhere. Um, because when you look at like Washington DC and I, and I'm, and I watch football every now and then I actually went to soldier stadium in Chicago and the outside of that stadium, they basically just put a football stadium inside a Coliseum. And if you look at old pictures of soldier stadium, you still see like the, it looks like Roman or Greek architecture built around it. And they just planted a football field inside of it. And then there's the story of like the great Chicago fire where just a you know a cow kicked over a lantern and burnt the whole city down so what did the city look like before the cow kicked the lantern over you know um and i think there's, there's a, a bunch of story. stories like that of cities burning in the mid 1800s as well yeah like just an, inor an inordinate burning. number like where were all these fires why were there all these fires happening yeah. citywide <laughs> fires that like burned entire city yeah <clears throat> you never see Suspicious. that now yeah 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 and then there's just remnants of these like great buildings that they said that they built when we were building like the Wild West. Like, and then the, the the stuff they show you that we built in Wild West is just dirt roads and wood houses. And it's nothing like the the structures you see around. And like the Salt Lake City Chapel is a great example. I'm just like, once once you see the truth, it's hard not to see it anymore. But. A lot of them have huge doors that look like they would be the size for giants to fit through as well. 15 to 20 feet doors on some of these huge megalithic structures and the, the stones and stuff being used to construct them, like you said, at a time when horse and buggies are being used. Like, it's not making <laughs> sense. It's not adding up. <laughs> you only have limited resources, so you're just going to put all your resources in the building, this giant structure out of, like, and, like, and then I, and I work at so I work yeah, uh, I work in construction, planning. so yeah. and I see large trucks and what it takes just to build a small house, and it's multiple trucks loads of material, and over paved roads, and like they're telling us that they drug all this stuff to this place on unpaved roads with wooden wheels, and if you ever try to push anything across dirt, like that's heavy, it's gonna dig into the dirt, like whatever the wheels are, it's gonna dig into the dirt, unless if you had like modern tech, which they didn't. But yeah, it doesn't make any sense how they got it done. But with, the, with those world fairs, they they claimed that they were building all of these temporary structures in record amounts of time, and then claiming that they're temporary so that they just destroyed them afterwards. And these structures are they don't look temporary; they look more beautiful and um, stable than half the stuff we construct. Well, most of the stuff we construct nowadays. And they're claiming that they would have just destroyed it afterwards. Like, oh, we just we just created this whole city, basically. It was, half of these places yeah. are huge. There's, you know, whole complexes, arenas, big buildings. And, oh, we created this, this whole small city for people to come 
to from all around the world, and then we're just going to destroy it afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, you didn't create yeah, we just, that. We just that was those already there. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and in the trees. world wars, a lot of places like that were were bombed. You know, like uh, in Germany and stuff, like these big palaces and everything. Like, it seems like there's been a concerted effort to destroy all of these old world, well, not all of them, but a bunch of these old world buildings and the the ones that aren't, they've commandeered them and claimed, you know, they are the masons, they're the ones that, you know, they claim they're the builders, but they're probably yeah. just the stealers, the inheritors of yeah. buildings that someone else built and then they gain power somehow and they took them over and turned them into you know, train stations and churches and arenas, like you said, all these other things. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, I don't believe the official narrative on these megalithic structures and huge buildings. I, but though I also don't follow the mainstream Tartarian yeah. uh, narrative either. I don't see the evidence that all of these things are coming from the civilization known as Tartary near Russia back in the day, like the, like a few years ago, like you never heard Tartarian or Tartary. It's like this new word that has come to describe this particular area of research, which I was already researching long before anyone called it Tartaria. Back then it usually would be called Atlantis. Like th this type of research would be more in that field. And even that to me has always just been a metaphor again. And yes. And, and the idea being that there's some advanced civilization before us that was worldwide and they created a lot of these megalithic structures. That's what I said in Atlantean Conspiracy. That's, uh, you know, but I've thought for long before any of this tar Tartaria stuff came along. And now people are just, now it's like this new box and anything relating to advanced potential worldwide civilizations and megalithic structures and it's like Roman Greco. Uh, architecture it's all tartarian now suddenly it's all based on this like you said a lot of it's roman clearly and greco like why is it has the in the conspiracy community why has this large field of research suddenly been yeah. brought into this little word and it, oh it's all tartaria it's like that was just a maybe i mean i'm, I'm open to that line of yeah. thinking but there's there's no books or videos I've seen that conclusively link all of this architecture and everything to Tartary and the people who lived at that time or anything like that. That's speculation at this point. I don't I don't even understand how Tartary got linked to yeah, <laughs> to I, all of these things in the first place. So um, it's it's been this huge subject. I was like, Eric, why don't you talk about Tartary? I don't know. Like, have you read my books? I I, I do. I talk about advanced worldwide civilizations existing before yeah. the current one and megalithic structures being built by them them potentially being giants or or something else um but that whole field of research has recently been narrowed down into this thing that everyone's calling tartaria and if you don't call it that it's like you're not you're not part of their little group not the club anymore. yeah i'm not part of yeah. the club anymore i can't talk about ancient worldwide civilizations anymore because i don't use that word Tartaria, yeah <laughs> and that, that could be controlled opposition narrative pushed out there just to it's kind of like you put a word out there see who uses it and uh and who rejects it and who rejects it gets sunned and uh, like you said about dragons and dinosaurs or something like that it could literally be the exact same thing but yeah. you create you create a narrative around it, and one of one of them is is what they actually are, and one of them is a false narrative that fits you know your evolution paradigm or whatever, and suddenly the exact same physical thing can be received totally differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Sorry. Yep. Uh, and if you look at the old coins, like they're the the coins of the Romans look like the coins of the U.S. today. They have the the face on the front, and they have the Masonic eagle on the back like the quarters do and it's just like it's almost like we're just a new roman empire just under a new name they just wanted to break it up so it's kind of like a monopoly but you don't want the the same name on every company mm -hmm. so you split up the names you give it well it's funny that the flags are all the same colors but you give them different flags um don't change the colors though um, right 
but yeah, yeah. they just it seems like it's a huge empire and they just kind of took everything exactly. yeah. just like you said making us free range slaves that get to choose our own occupation like they just did the same thing with the geographical political geopolitical thing where they just divided up arbitrary little divisions yeah. and uh, make you think and get you all patriotic and make you think and that's your, your little your little arbitrary lines on a map mean something when in reality you the you're just as controlled as everyone else in their fake pen <laughs> yeah the same people controlling our countries controlling north korea controlling ch probably china probably russia probably all these other countries and, they're all uh, statist governments none of them are voluntary so all of them are the, the, these forced systems of government backed yeah, up by absurd. a monopoly of violence and all using coercion to steal money from their population in the form of taxes so you can call it socialism and communism and republic and democracy and all these different names but they're all slight variations on the same statist scam which is this thing where you get people to have a representative government and then this thing has a monopoly of violence and they're forced to pay for its existence in perpetuity or else you get agents descended on you and stealing your money and your person taking yeah. you away it's a literal mob yeah if you ever watched the men in black and uh they have like that machine that flashes people's memory and then they give them a brand new narrative to go with it's almost like i don't know if like smart tvs have that capability where they flash a certain like frequency of light into someone's eyes because some people just go straight off what they heard on the news their favorite flavor of news either it's fox or cnn um that's funny you say that uh they, have you heard about the flicker rate on the television and how it actually does do that you know how okay. when you when you film a tv screen you can see because the flicker yeah. rate on the tv and the thing you're the filming with rate. are yeah they're not uh, aligned so you can see it that way and i guess they did tests to find out which flicker rate would quick uh, put humans in a alpha brainwave state uh, the quickest. And so the, yeah. the flicker rate that the television is currently on just so happens to be the, the rate that most quickly hypnotizes human beings into being in the most receptive state. Yeah. And so, yeah, within a, a couple minutes, uh, a, a regular TV watcher is put into an alpha brainwave state. Whereas someone who doesn't watch TV regularly, it takes a lot longer than that for the effect of the television to hypnotize them that way. So not only does it have the effect you're talking about, it cumulatively uh, works better on people who watch television more often. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, they're getting used to it, yeah. And that's why they literally, like, they're just a parrot from the TV. It was like, and it's funny that they trust the TV more than your own family member or someone you've known your entire life. You're just like, you think this person that you've known forever is just out to lie to you, but the person on the television that gets paid money to speak would never lie to you. Right? The, the hypnotist. And just like in, in hypnotism, at first, you know, it, the, the initial hypnosis takes longer. Like I'm saying, uh, people who don't watch television, the flicker rate doesn't instantly bring you into an alpha brainwave state like that. But yeah. once you've been hypnotized, you know, they can just like snap their fingers and you can go from being normal in your everyday and then you're, you're in your complete hypnotized state. And even shows even have like news programs have those little ding, 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 ding sounds and stuff that they do. Those little ring sounds yeah. those trigger sounds are part of what hypnotists use to bring you into the state. It's like when I say this, when I snap my fingers, when I do this, and for them it's it's truth. It's like when the news comes out, breaking news. When you hear that type of uh, that, that whole thing for people who are in that hypnotized state, that means, oh, listen up, truth is coming. I'm about to hear what's happening in the world now. Tell me, yeah. Dan, rather, you know, what, yeah. what's all the important news for today? Yeah. And, 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 and they then believe it because they've been, that they've been hypnotized. Yeah. You come along, you tell them all that's fake, and then they look at you like you're like a ghost him or something. I don't know. It's just like they they lose trust in you too. 
you know, they don't they don't take you seriously anymore when you tell them something fringe or taboo, um, which is fine. What, that's what happens in a hypnotist show. Uh, I've seen a couple of them, with, even with my friends in them. Like in one of them, he'd, he'd make the guy forget the number seven and have you count from one to ten. And he'd be like, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten. And everyone's laughing. It was in my school. Everyone's laughing at it and straight face. He has no idea what's going on. And and this is a kid that he couldn't do he couldn't do that with a straight face if he wasn't hypnotized. He would be laughing. He couldn't. He believes it. He, yeah, and I talked to him afterwards, and he was pretty flabbergasted about it as well, and just kind of like, I don't know, I just, and then we had it on video, and we got to watch it with him, and you could see in his face, and he's just like, he was flabbergasted at himself as well, and if you approached him during that state, like the hypnotist did, trying to get him to say the number seven, he's like, what's three plus four? Like, he couldn't huh. figure out what three plus four was, and it was really racking his brain and, and all this stuff. And and isn't that exactly like you're saying about like the news or something when your friends, your family come to you and they tell you things that should be common sense, like three plus four, and they're just like, what do you mean Trump is controlled opposition? Yeah. He's That's the savior. <laughs> Elon. Elon's another yeah. one, man. Like, the Twitter files, though. They're like he's he's exposing Twitter. I'm like, did you need a video to tell you that Twitter was not being honest with you? Like, I don't know if you really needed a video for that, but if that's what it takes to get you to have an idol, then that's easy for them to do. Like, they'll sell you any idol they want. Mm. And uh, I I think it's hilarious that they love Elon so much, and he's trying to put brain chips into everybody. You know, like exactly, he's the brain, brain chip guy. guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if there was if there was any bigger spokesperson for the new world order, it would be the guy that promotes brain chips in people. Yeah. Yet somehow, like he's he's like so popular, people love think he's so intelligent. They hang off of every word the guy says. He's the brain. He wants microchips. He he's the guy in the Terminator movie that made it. I <laughs> brought the hellscape to us, and everyone's like, "Yeah, let's go." Yeah. That was a great movie. <laughs> you missed the message. <laughs> he missed the message. The guy's not a good guy. Yeah. <laughs> and I, my buddy that I talked to him about, like, uh, that we just can't go live anywhere, like Homestead and stuff. They're like, what do you think it would take to, like, overrule everyone or overrule the powers that be? I was like, if we actually tried, I feel like it would be kind of like Terminator. It'd be like, because they have, like, drone technology. And imagine what they... They, they have they don't even tell us that they have i'm sure there's tons right. of stuff and uh, it's going to be like skynet they don't need the soldiers to do what they're going to do you know they only need a small handful of people and uh, right. we're, we're entering that stage of the game now where because i was just talking about that uh how if we all break away and do our own homesteading and have breakaway civilizations then the central authority is now smaller and and not powerful enough to come and get us all but what you're just reminding me of is hey we're living in the robot ai generation where you don't need manpower anymore they got all the money and the resources and stuff uh they don't even need uh to have us backing them if we all tried to break away and there's still just a s small minority of super rich psychopaths that have all the money and control like that they can just send Terminator style robots and drones after us, like you said that you know, it's 10 years ago. If you said that to me, I think that was, sounds silly. But right now that sounds completely that sounds like what, what would happen, especially 10 years from now, when when, the, when it would be likely it's right. Nobody's it's not going to happen now. Nobody's breaking away. I don't see any breakaway civilizations happening yet. But if if, say, this um, the snowball starts happening, people start recognizing that we need to do homesteading and decentralization is the only answer. Uh, yeah. I bet Terminator, Skynet, drone yeah. strikes and stuff is our reality. Yeah, and that's real scary. It's, it's yeah, advanced have, to that degree. Yeah, they have drones of thermal on it, so you can't even hide like <laughs> at all. Like They're going to see you no matter what. Mm. Yeah, it's crazy to think that you almost feel powerless, but you almost you have to kind of play their game a bit, but you just can't let any of like the extra 
news stories, like all the fear mongering stuff not get to you. Once you don't let that stuff get to you and your life gets a lot better. And uh, I feel like, I don't know about if uh, you've ever thought of this, but I think heaven and hell are uh, probably not like physical. I don't think they're like physical places. I think there's like a fiery place you go to and you're going to be thrown into pits of fire or there's not like a pearly gate place where you go to. I feel like it's more of a state of consciousness where when you do good for other people, you feel good inside. Like when you do, like if I do something for my friend, I feel better than if I did that same thing for myself. Like it's kind of like, I feel like that goes into like, everyone is one with the creator and you're connected through your soul. So when you do something, you're when that person feels the gratitude that you give them, you're basically getting a part of that back to you. Kind of like when you, if you've ever watched the video, someone like breaks their bone and you kind of have that same, like you feel that pain, even though you weren't actually there and broke your bone, but just seeing it happen, um, you get like, a I don't know, maybe it's just me, but you get that pain receptive, even though you weren't there. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen that movie, What Dreams May Come with Robin Williams? No, I will watch it though. Oh, I love that movie. Um, I think it's a great metaphor for what may happen after death and like you said heaven's not a place but it's like a state of consciousness in that movie the when someone dies um their state of consciousness at death determines what happens to them in their afterlife state and so like we talk about life being dreamlike very much so is in, in the afterlife state and in, in that movie and the people who let's say they had a hellish death or, or they had a negative mind space, they create a dream-like negative space mm -hmm. for themselves in the afterlife because of that versus someone who was maybe compassionate and positive and everything. Their afterlife realm that they create, their dream that they dream once they're dead is a beautiful dream, a heavenly dream. And so yeah, it's not a maybe not a physical place, but it's your dream because it's what your consciousness creates for you after you die. And if yeah. your consciousness is highly negative and didn't gonna, learn the nightmare. lessons, yeah, you might have a really nightmarish dream that is a hellscape, and that's what hell could be. And likewise, if you live your life in a positive way, learning compassion, develop your spirituality, when you get to the moment of death, your consciousness may be of such a character that the dream world that you create is so heavenly that, that that's what, and you get to live there. That could be what happens um, yeah, to all of us. For sure. We don't, we don't have to like, like, is it like there's some place called hell and it's already there and we just go, oh shit, I'm here now. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's probably a state of consciousness. And as we know in dreams, states of consciousness create seemingly physical worlds that we can go in and experience and so if our state of consciousness at death is hellish we will create a hellish realm that we live in and and vice versa so i think it like you said it's you, it's like you go right back around to yourself it's like oh well heaven's not a physical place because it would be my consciousness that creates it but because my consciousness creates it it's a dream world that i create and then i go back and live in that dream world and i totally believe it and i believe i'm in a physical world and there i am in my physical heaven yeah and, and it's, but it's not physical because again ultimately we're always just consciousness having an experience um, yeah. i'm just my my pet peeve is i don't like the current experience enough <laughs> I feel like I'm deserving of living in a place that's yeah. better than this, and I don't like a lot of things here. And I'm, I'm, I'm I don't like that my body's going to deteriorate and then die, and I'm going to get sick and old age, and everyone I love around me is going to die and disappear, and then so am I. And, and I'm just irate about it. <laughs> and I would like yeah. to live somewhere that's much nicer and compassionate, and nobody has to get sick and die. And I'm, <laughs> and I think it exists, and I want to go there. And I'm like a little spoiled child, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be like that until I can get there. I'm not gonna uh, consent this time, you know. I, I yeah. think I must have consented every time until now, and it's like I'm so adamant now that it's like that's not happening again. Even if I have to play the spoiled child that just says no, no, I'm gonna do and, that. Uh, Santo Santos Bonacci has something on that where it's like when he thinks when when you transcend back into heaven that there are angels there that try to convince you to go back oh you didn't do this good enough you didn't do that good enough you need to redo this you need to be a better person here 
Um, they no. try to trick you into going back <laughs> to the hellish world, and they do. It's like a soul trap, basically the soul trap. But yeah, I thought that was interesting coming from him as well. He's a good guy it too. Sounds. Uh, I hear them in the NDE accounts, like they take you through a life review, and you're in this space of consciousness where you feel what you did to everyone else as well. So like if you were an asshole to somebody or you hurt them in some way, you, you relive the experience from their perspective too. So it's like they're yeah. forcing you to um, feel every negative thing that you might have brought into anyone else's life and then using that as like collateral as to, to force you into living again. You got to do this. See, it went perfect. See how, how much, how painful that was. You caused that pain, Eric. Now you should, you know, go back and do that karma again because that thing you said to that person or that thing you did to that person is so awful. Now you have yeah. to go back and live a whole lifetime again. But we're going to yeah. memory wipe you before that, so yeah. you don't even know that you're, that you're going to. You won't remember any of this. They probably don't uh, even tell you that. Yeah. It would it's be like, like it would be like going through all of your schooling. And then at your final report card, you get like an A minus, and they're like, "Sorry, you're gonna start all over again." And then they do the Men in Black <laughs> memory wipe, and they're like, "Try right again." Back, like, what? what? Like at least let me have my memories. I'll go by all the way back to kindergarten. I'll play with the blocks again. You can teach me the ABCs. Yeah. I'll do. The... But at least let me maintain the memory why do i have yeah. to not know the abcs again why on earth would you make me relearn all the basics just so i can if the point is to further and further refine your karma you know well don't make me yeah. relearn the basics every time and potentially fall further down the the hall but nobody talks about this everyone thinks like oh every reincarnation you're going to do better yeah well what if you're put in worse situations like karma is very based on whatever situations happen to come into your life if you live a really boring life and there's it, by yourself in a mountain somewhere you may in a time period when there isn't a bunch of people around to even create a bunch of drama and negative karma versus nowadays seven billion people in cities and you, there's all this karma just forced upon us um, yeah Oh, another another thought I had on about how you're we we're talking about when when your consciousness goes into another body and you basically you forget your your past life and you have to start over again. What do you think that maybe that knowledge itself, like what you're learning, is actually stored somewhere in your brain, and that your consciousness is just pulling that information, just like eyesight or touch and feel, like it's just information. And when your consciousness leaves this body, it's leaving all that information behind. And you have to restart because you have a new new memory card, basically. You don't have the old memory card. You threw the mm -hmm. other one away. Mm. But would you think that there's something like they call the Akashic Record, where all experience and stuff is still stored somewhere? Or do you think maybe it literally disappears because we no longer have that hardware? And so it just goes away into the nothingness and then we have to start over again because that information now no longer exists yeah maybe it could go either way I, but i tend to think that it probably still exists somewhere i think somewhere. That everything you know it seems like it would make sense that everything no, is retained somehow somewhere at least to the god to the originating consciousness there's a complete record of everything yeah, 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 for sure. No, that makes sense. Yeah, um, because there's stories of people having past lives, or they remember their past lives like kids, like early on. It seems like the younger the kid is, if they did have a past life, the more they remember it. Just kind of like when you wake up out of a dream, right. you remember more freshly, like right then and there. Whereas, like the older you're gonna get, the you're not gonna remember your past life when you're, you know, twenty compared to right. when you're five. That's it. The, the, all the cases of people remembering their past life, the vast, vast majority are children. And most of them start to forget their memories as they become adults, too. Like you said, very few of them maintain their memories of their previous life once they reach adulthood. And then that, that can explain like deja vu, too. Um, you just have a very early remembrance and it just sparks that 
that uh, that memory you had somewhere wherever it's kept and mm. it just jogs your memory for that little bit and it puts you in that deja vu state where you're like i've been here before 